Hello and welcome to the Road to Westminster 2015. I'm Roshan Mohammed Sali. On this week's show, we're going to take a look at how British Muslims could potentially affect the British general election. With three weeks to go before voting day, opinion polls are showing an almost dead heat between the Conservatives and the opposition Labour Party. So that means the votes of the ethnic or religious minorities could make the difference in key constituencies, thus potentially determining the outcome of the entire election. For the past several elections, much has been made about the so-called Muslim vote. But on today's show, we're going to try to separate the myth from the reality. Historically, block Muslim voting does indeed seem to have been exploited by clever politicians. But were those exceptions to the rule? Can we talk about such a thing as the Muslim vote when the community is so diverse? And if we can, what are the issues which affect Muslims the most and who are they most likely to vote for? Here's Faiza Ahmed with a report from Bradford where she joined the campaign trail of a man who's definitely benefited from bloc Muslim voting on two occasions, George Galloway MP. In 2012, Bradford experienced its own revolution after George Galloway inflicted a shocking defeat on Labour in the Bradford West seat, showing the significance of the Muslim vote. Successive British governments have launched attack and invasion and occupation of one Muslim country after another, accompanied by a cacophony of anti-Muslim propaganda, Islamophobia, abuse, uh, false accusation and so on. We are the party and I am the individual politician most associated with the defense of the Muslim community and its rights abroad as well as at home. The Respect Party candidate's victory not only challenged Labour's safe seat but also a block-based voting system that's been in operation in the town for several decades. Much of the migration that took place from Pakistan to Bradford happened along the lines of kinship and this is something that eventually filtered down into the way people voted and became known as braderie or clan politics. In terms of braderie, it, basically it's um, it's just, it's a, I suppose it's a club, isn't it, really? So if you have an extended family, and I think in terms of politics, it's influenced the selection of candidates, and that's, I think, turned off a lot of people. Feeling frustrated and ostracised with this system, the town's Muslim women and youth mobilised to help secure Galloway's win. The 2011 census revealed the number of Muslims in Bradford made up almost a quarter of the city's population with the largest proportion of people belonging to the Pakistani community. Issues of inequality in employment and educational attainment along with Islamophobia have continued to affect this community and could determine the way they vote. In Bradford, people perhaps feel under siege, the fact that they don't have a voice. Uh, the Charlie Hebdo issue, the recent last year's uh, attacks on Gaza, uh, the Kashmir issue is still a raw issue in, in, in Bradford. So, um, George actually uh, represents the Muslim community here. But not everybody seemed to agree. This gentleman here and he'll be gone after seven of May. Will you find him? No. The time we can find him? No. There's still a split between the younger and the elder voters, with the elder ones opting for the more traditional parties. I am like a Labour Party. Somebody come in into my house, I am vote Labour Party. Conservative Party. Their policy is good. It's good for the country. George Galloway. He's the only person that I've come across in my lifetime that's spoken up for me. Physically, in public, um, for all the time I've known, for ever since I've actually been aware politically, um, he's been the only voice that we have had. With the local Muslim voters giving such diverse opinions, the Bradford West race will be one of the most closely observed electoral battles nationally. And the heat is on George Galloway as he looks to retain his seat. Pfizer Ahmed, Road to Westminster. To discuss the British uh, Muslim vote, we have two guests in the studio with us today. Uh, Mohsin Abbas is a journalist and activist who's the driving force behind the recently launched Muslim Manifesto, a set of policy recommendations targeting all Muslim and non-Muslim politicians in local councils and parliament. 
And uh, Dilly Hussain is the deputy editor of the Five Pillars uh, British Muslim News website. He also writes for the Huffington Post, Al Jazeera, and many others. Uh, welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for coming in today. Muslim, if I can start with you. Now, obviously, you're a proponent of Muslims engaging in voting. Uh, they can make a difference. Explain to me why. Well, I'm less of a, a, a proponent of uh, actually voting as I am of people becoming politically aware mm. and using the process of uh, democracy as a way of making an impact in society. I think Muslims have been uh, blind voting. The brotherly system, as we've heard, is definitely one of the, the, the key problems within that. And they've been voting down this blind alley of assuming that the Labour Party has values which are ethical, mm -hmm. has values which are moral, and stand up uh, for the same values that, that, that they're, they're Islamic values, if you like. And those are generosity, kindness, fair play, justice. Yeah. At the heart of everything is justice. I don't feel personally in the present uh, democratic environment that there are very many parties which primarily base their policies on ethical or moral grounds. Okay, so They're what should Muslims economic. do then? Sorry? What should Muslims do then? Well, I, th I think that Muslims should be, first of all, thinking about these things, about what are the policies of these parties. I don't think that happens. Largely people mm -hmm. vote because they just have been told to vote one way or another. Or I don't think people are clear about uh, policies. Working classes generally, or people on the ground, are not that clear about what policies are. I mean, the policies that have been, uh, the manifestos that have been launched only got launched this week. So, to be honest with you, yeah. it begs the question, why wasn't there a longer time for people to analyze what on earth these parties oh, are saying? One month's enough, surely. I think, that you need, I, I, I think you need a little bit more. I think politics is the most yeah. important thing in our lives, uh, Russian, and I think that you need time to absorb these things to so, analyze. So what you're saying is basically Muslims should do their homework and vote according to what they find out. Uh, Dilly, you're kind of a bit skeptical about the whole voting thing, are you? Or? No, of course, uh, and, and my opinion is based on what's been apparent for the last 15 years. I mean, the Muslim community in Britain have been engaging in politics for the best part of 30, 40 years, even when our forefathers mm. arrived here as economic migrants. However, the last 15, 20 years, with the rise of Islamophobia, post 9-11, post 7-7, post Woolwich, um, what we've seen is not that much difference between the mainstream parties in their rhetoric against Islam and Muslims. And I have to disagree with Muslim that I don't think any of the mainstream parties have ever based their policies on ethics or morals. It's based on secular liberalism. Mm. And if you scratch beneath the surface, secular liberalism is a direct clash with Islamic values. Unfortunately, the mainstream political parties, whilst mm. their rhetoric may seem quite attractive and appealing to Muslim voters, uh, when you look at their anti-terror legislation, the current uh, CTS Act, uh, it seems to be a, a clear witch hunt. But Delhi, I mean, we live here, yeah. okay? Uh, and if we live here and we don't vote and we don't have a voice in the system, then we can't really complain about foreign policy and Islamophobia, can we? Not necessarily, because we assume that the only form of political engagement mm. is voting, and that's not true. If we look back at history, whenever changes, radical changes have been made to a democracy, we've seen that these changes have been made outside of the system. Mm. Um, so I don't believe that voting... strategically voting? Would you go as far... If there was a candidate in your local constituency <coughs> and he was a, a die-hard Israel supporter and there was somebody who could block him if you voted for that person, yeah. would, you, would you understand that? No, I, could, I totally appreciate that. I, mm. I don't, I don't uh, dismiss the short-term benefits yeah. of a strategic vote. However, we must think about it when we apply the whole lesser of two evils principle. When you vote for a pro-Palestine Labour candidate in your local constituency, you're not just voting for that. Mm. You're voting for everything the Labour Party stands for. This is something we need to keep in mind. Uh, uh, Muslim, I mean, is the Muslim vote a bit over-egged? I mean, does it really exist? And do, is there such a thing as Muslim bloc voting? It might have happened a few times, but those were exceptions, right? Uh, there are about 40 constituencies, between 32 and 40, j depending on whose statistics you take. You elect, say, 32. Mm. Uh, I think the Muslim News recently said 40 constituencies can be directly impacted by right. the vote. So there is a, a possibility. However, the Muslims are a, 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 not a homogenous community. Mm. They're Somalis, they're Iraqis, they're, 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 but they do tend to live in, uh, con, uh, uh, in dense areas, yeah. in urban environments. So I think it can impact the local vote. As we saw in Bradford, that's an example. Yeah, I mean, George happened. Galloway's tapped into it twice, hasn't he now? Sure, and I think that that's possible. Now, yeah. the issue that we've raised within the manifesto is that first of all, you have to have a process of thinking about what your impact is in society. I don't think that's happened. Our first problem, really, is to get people to understand the power of their own uh, own, own vote, get the, uh, to understand that they, they should have some strategy. And look, ultimately, I would probably advocate the idea that if the mainstream parties don't uh, buck up mm. and come into some sort of uh, ethical 
uh, and moral space, which it, which it conforms with a Muslim yeah. uh, conscience. Because the reality is, you know, paying taxes, fight, go, going for votes for, for parties that are going to then launch wars on everybody or, or do down the, 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 the poor within society. These are fundamentally against Muslim uh, Dilly, principles. Dilly, are you shaking your head just in 30 seconds because we have no, to move on? I'm shaking my head because I think to uh, desire or hope that these mainstream political parties would base their policies on ethics and morals, mm. it, it goes against the very grain of, the, of their founding fathers and that is that these parties and the whole system was found on secular liberalism which is at loggerheads with religion as a whole. But that's the, that's, that's the dogma of this country, yeah, isn't it? But again, that doesn't necessarily mean that we become isolationist. What yeah. I'm saying is that voting isn't the only uh, tool to be engaged, politically okay. active or even aware. We're going to pick this up in a few minutes' time. Um, our reporter, Faiza Ahmed, uh, has been canvassing the opinion of ordinary Muslims here in London and also in the north of England on how they'll vote and why. Here's what she found out. Muslim vote is hugely significant in uh, the current coming elections. Uh, they are going to make a difference into who comes into power because up to 40 seats, there are the 40 seats which Muslims can move either towards the Tories or to, uh, towards the Labour. And because of that, and because the, uh, these elections, this could be a very narrow win for any of the parties, Muslims can make a huge difference. You have to participate. The only way to make a difference within uh, the government is if you actually participate and uh, elect the candidates that, that, that are most sympathetic to Muslims' issues. One of them is Islamophobia. Uh, the main issue that affects Muslims, in my view, is um, in engagement and apathy. There is a sense of disempowerment. There is a sense that somehow the political class, the media, is there to have a go at the Muslims for all sorts of reasons. And I think we need to break that cycle, we need to break their perception and give a genuine sense of belief within the community that we can make a difference. It's kind of like, it's issues more like to do with like, not integrating so much with um, with the community. It feels segregated still and people are still kind of like going onto like little corners. There's many issues that affect everybody here. Primary is obviously the education of our children, which is very, very important. Uh, then obviously uh, as the, the population is aging, health, health is critical. Uh, mental health, especially within the ethnic minorities, is quite a big issue. Uh, I'm Dilly, I mean, we've seen in that report that, you know, some of the issues that are concerning Muslims, that those who won't vote, but a lot of Muslims, especially perhaps younger people, won't vote at all, will they? Yeah. Why is that? And obviously we need to appreciate that this voting apathy isn't exclusive to the Muslim community. Last general election, nearly a third of the mm. electorate didn't turn up to vote. And that's not necessarily because they're lazy or they can't be bothered, it's because the democratic system and process has failed them, all right? I want to make three very important points here. I think the Muslim community unfortunately suffers from very short-term uh, memory loss. They forget that under the Blair government, who many Muslims backed, um, mm. he took the country to an illegal war, which mm. cost the lives of two million Muslims in Iraq. Um, and then we put Cameron into power, and we've seen non-stop anti-terror legislation and the rhetoric coming from uh, the, the Conservative government has been uh, something short of uh, uh, an Orwellian police state. Um, and also we talk about the importance of educating our children. We've mm. seen the Trojan horse uh, scandal. Uh, we've seen the witch hunt of uh, schools in Tower Hamlets. And th this has been state sanctioned. Yeah. So we need to remember this. I mean, uh, Mustin, would, would any of those uh, kind of issues that Dilly's raised, the foreign policy, I mean, will any of that be changed with uh, more participation in the system? Can I take you to the future? Uh, the Muslim population. <laughs> OK. So let, me, let me take you a look. The Muslim population, well, I'm actually going to take you to the past first right, and okay. then fast forward. Uh, the Muslim population has doubled within the last 10 years. Okay. 2.77 million is the latest estimate. I would say probably a lot more. Oh, 3 million. million 3 least, million. Yeah, yeah. Let's go 10 years, 20 years, 30 years forward. If the con same continued pattern of the rise of a Muslim population, you could have up to 9 to 10 million Muslims by halfway through this century. Okay. That is a huge potential political power base. Now, my issue is that the neocons, by and large... Don't and say that. That's going to scare the EDL <laughs> and all that kind of... Anyway, yeah. Well, the <laughs> neocons and, and the, 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 the neoliberals uh, that Dilly's been kind of uh, yeah. you know, uh, boxing, <laughs> is, 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 it's really their headache. 
They are looking at those statistics. I'm looking at those statistics, and this is what we're saying. As a part of the Muslim manifesto... You're saying Muslims going to take over this country? And I'm, I'm, <laughs> what I'm saying <laughs> is that you, uh, uh, you need to have some strategies and ideas about what this country is going to be, because you are going to have a major political yeah. voice in here, whether you like it or not. Now, uh, control... That can change policy. Yeah. That can, that can stop wars. Correct. That can stop Correct. Islamophobia yeah, in not, this country. Not really? I mean, I, well, I, I think that unless you get uh, controlled opposition or a breakup of that vote, yeah. if that voting bloc or that Muslim vote starts looking at what its ethical values are, for instance, uh, you know, would they vote for uh, three main parties that all want to go to war or yeah. enjoy a kind of an imperialist foreign policy or, or just support America and what they do? Well, <laughs> if they didn't, say there was another party that emerged mm. on the scene Which that did. That did happen. But, but say, I mean, we, it's a, it's a yeah. free country. We could set up a party tomorrow. In that party, we could, we could call it the Ethics Party. Yeah. We could uh, notionally have a little set of policies which gave that portion of the of population. And those, that portion of the population which is fair is not just Muslim. Okay. Christians just launched a, 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 a moral manifesto, effectively, yeah. in politics. Just not more than a couple of months ago. Delia, I'll give you an opportunity to respond. Okay. Look, um, I, I think we need to appreciate that the Muslims have been voting. It's not as if they've not been voting. I think we need to take mm. a principle from our forefathers. Our forefathers who arrived in the 60s and the 70s, they created the backbone of what we have today. Mm. The halal butchers, the mosques, and, and numerous other services, the, the, the funeral and burial services in, in, in cemeteries. They did all of this fairly and uh, arguably independent of the help from the MPs or their local councillors. We can revert back to not the tribal or lack of understanding yeah. as many of our forefathers respectively had, but the whole uh, independence of just doing things off your own back. And well, we're doing that already, aren't we? I mean, no, no, I mean it's, we've been voting, but we haven't been voting wisely, no, as Muslims No, 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 we've been voting for whichever councillor may give us a, a mosque uh, <laughs> extension. That's what we've been voting based on. So I think, is again... Is wrong with that? Or? Uh, no, the thing is, what I'm trying to say is previously, 30, 40 years ago, yeah. that wasn't the case. Yeah. Our forefathers built the mosque, they done the halal butchers, they did all the services that we take for granted now and forget that they did this a lot of it off their own back. And they were migrants and we were born here. Uh, uh, Muslim, j just before we move on, um, how's your campaign going? Uh, what's the response been to it? I, well, I think that uh, we focused on leadership as well as grassroots. And of course, with anything that you begin, which is for the first time, it takes time. Yeah. And people are working out their alliances. But large blocks within the, the Muslim religious community certainly haven't been able to, to attack the idea of setting a, a set of visionary goals. So at the moment, yeah. uh, I think it's a long it's a long term thing. For us, it's a five to ten year yeah. uh, uh, five to ten year game. Yeah. But within it is is the notion that for the first time Muslims should really look meticulously at what they want in this country. Yeah. Not just be looking at today or just in their own little localities, yeah. but think big. Okay. And, and, and be part uh, of it. I know you want to come yeah. back in, but uh, we have to move on. Okay, uh, cool. Maybe you'll get a chance to, okay, to get no your point in a bit <laughs> later on. Uh, we've been receiving some uh, Facebook uh, posts and tweets uh, on our social media pages. Hopefully we can see one of them on our wall now. This is about George Galloway in Bradford. One positive and one negative. Zahir from Pakistan says, George is doing more than what our Islamic leaders are supposed to do for Gaza. A big shame for all you so-called Muslim leaders. Vote GG. Uh, and Errol here in the UK uh, doesn't like George Galloway, obviously. Uh, Galloway went to Bradford to get the Muslim vote. The voters there love anything that's anti-British. So Errol says everybody in Bradford is anti-British. Um, uh, Dilly, is George Galloway going to win in Bradford? And, and if he does, is that a good thing for um, Muslims? I don't really want to comment whether it's a good or bad thing, but what George did do is quite arguably revolutionary. When he went there and he won two elections, yeah. and he basically split a predominantly Labour constituency. Mm. And what that does show are the Muslims are seeking an alternative. Mm. Now, whether George offers that alternative is entirely a different matter, which <laughs> I won't discuss here. But um, this whole thing about anything that's anti-British, I don't think the British themselves know what British means. Yeah, yeah and even values, yeah, yeah. British values, you know, a, a very ambiguous, ill-defined term. Yeah. Muslims have been integrating in this country for the last 30, 40 years. You see Muslims in the public sector, in the private sector, schools, doctors, and all sorts. Now, the issue is when, when we're forced to assimilate. Now. To force uh, a group of people to accept a set of values, yeah. right? It's unnatural and it's actually unliberal and anti democratic. Yeah. So to say that, you know, the people of Bradford, the Muslims of Bradford, like anything that's anti British, that's, that's uh, absurd to say, to the least. Uh, Abbas, uh, really quickly, uh, kind of, uh, is, is Galloway going to win in Bradford? And 
I think uh, Galloway probably will win because I think he has uh, uh, that classic trick of uh, uh, being a one-trick pony. Mm. You can't get complicated with the public because they're not really that smart about politics as a whole. We're not taught it in schools. We're not taught politics throughout our kind of... We, 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 we learn it as we go along. And I think that has to change as well. We need to educate people about politics. George will probably win, yeah. I think. Uh, he's got a 10,000 majority, isn't it? So I think it'll be tough to lose that. Uh, I think we can uh, go to a headline now, a story that appears in uh, the British news, Muslim News website, Five Pillars. Uh, now, this is Hizbut Tahrir, which is an Islamic party uh, here in Britain, uh, urging Muslims not to vote in the general election. Uh, they, uh, they're against the democratic system. They say it's a waste of time. Uh, you kind of, it'll secularize the community, uh, so it's not worth voting at all. Muslim? The truth is, if you opt out, you leave the ground empty for neocons to take over. And that's exactly what they're doing. Mm. They will not only take control of your opposition, uh, your, your voice as an opposition, but they will also break you up. There, is a, there are a, a host of uh, organizations like Policy Exchange uh, and various others who are out there actively investing in the, the control of this Muslim uh, vote. Now, the they don't want Muslims to vote. So, the, the, I mean, the right wing, uh, Dili, they, they don't want Muslims to vote, right? So well, Obviously, I can't speak on behalf of Hizbut Tahrir, but what I can say <coughs> is that, uh, even though that's my website, our website there, mm. I, I, I would say, probably say the headline is slightly misleading. Is okay. that, is that what, they're trying, what we're trying to say when we, were, when we published that piece, was that what Hizbut Tahrir is saying is that we've been there, done it. Yeah. And, and, and what have we achieved? Um, but we need to make it very clear that when we say not to vote, and it's not just Hizbut Tahrir who believe that voting uh, will not achieve anything, we also have to appreciate they say that from an Islamic perspective. There's also other okay. Muslim groups within our community that right. just generally don't believe anything can be achieved from the democratic okay. system. But One but last thing. But, but no, we have to move on, we have to move on. Sorry, because we're okay. coming to the end of the show. I'm no sorry worries. to cut you off. Uh, look, we're going to go to a last headline. This is the story of the week uh, in Britain. Uh, the uh, <laughs> governments uh, and the media's um, favorite Muslim in this country, Majid Nawaz, caught on camera in a strip club. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's a guy that's pushed constantly by the British media and he criticizes Islamic extremists all the time. Yeah. Uh, now the Lib Dems, who he's representing uh, for Kilburn and Hampstead, I believe, are sticking by him and they say that it was a private matter and he's still their man. Uh, Mossin, your thoughts? Well, I think this is fundamentally what is the problem with, with modern politics here in Britain, that if you have no morality and no ethics at the heart of your political, uh, your representatives, what on earth do you expect in terms of your policies? If, our own, if we haven't had a discussion about the, mm. the moral bankruptcy which is emerging within Britain, I think the decay is inevitable. Okay. And I think this is where Muslims come in. We still have a notion or a sense of and traditional ethics, values and, morality, and ethics yes. and morality. That's what we have to offer this, this, this political Dilly, system. in 30 seconds, your response to the Majid um, Nawaz story. I, I think many would argue that Majid Nawaz is, is a great example of liberals um, to actually <laughs> go out on a strip club during Ramadan and, you know, uh, pat on the back for many liberals would say, however, what's shocking is that Nick Clegg and Paddy, uh, Paddy Ashdown, Ashdown yeah. yeah, they've, they've not come out and uh, distanced themselves from this, this, this uh, individual, not on the basis that he went to a strip club, the fact that he harassed a woman. Mm. You know, would they accept that from any other uh, parliamentary candidate if they did that in a cafe, touched a, wait a waitress, or if they touched their work colleague under the table mm. indecently? They'd have to come out and, and distance themselves, but they've not done this. Um, also, they've defended Majid Nawaz when he tweeted yes. those photos about the Prophet Muhammad So we need to appreciate the, 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 yeah. these are the guys that we've And the Lib Dems is apparently a party that a lot of Muslims would like to vote for. They're making it very difficult for that to happen. Of course. Thank you sure. guys for coming today. It was, it was a lot of fun. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, you. That is all the time we have for today. Uh, I hope we've been able to shed some light on how Muslims may vote in the upcoming uh, general election. Join us again next week for more features and analysis that you won't see in the mainstream media in the run-up to the British general election on May the 7th. Bye-bye.